From around the globe, it's theCUBE, with digital coverage of Postgres Vision 2021. Brought to you by EDB. Hello everyone, this is Dave Vellante for theCUBE, and we're here covering Postgres Vision 2021, the virtual version, the CUBE virtual, if you will, and welcome to our power panel. Now in this session, we'll dig into database modernization. We want to better understand how and why customers are tapping open source to drive innovation, but at the same time, they've got to deliver the resiliency and enterprise capabilities that they're used to that are now necessary to support today's digital business requirements. And with me are three experts on these matters. Abdul Sheikh is global CTO and president of Sintra. Young Il Cho, AKA Charlie, is the high availability cluster sales manager at Dow One CNS. And Alan Villalobos is the director of development partnerships at IBM. Gentlemen, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, Dave. Nice to be here. Thank you, Dave. All right, let's talk trends and frame the problem. Abdul, I want to start with you. Sintra, you're all about this topic, accelerating innovation, using EDB Postgres, helping customers move to modern platforms and, and doing so, you got to do it cost effectively, but what's driving these moves? What are the problems that you're seeing at the organizations that you serve? Oh, so let me quickly introduce uh, Abdul Sheikh, CTO. I'll quickly introduce Sintra. So we are a multi-cloud and database architecture MSP. And we've been around for 25 plus years, headquartered in New York and the UK. But as a global organization, we're serving <clears throat> our SMB uh, customers as well as large enterprise customers. And the trends we're seeing, certainly in this day and age, is transformation and modernization. And what that means is customers looking to get out of their legacy platforms, get out of their legacy data centers, and really move towards a modern strategy with a lower cost base while still retaining resiliency and freedom, you know, ultimately in terms of where they're going. The key words are really, by I see the driving this, number one is choice, right? They've been historically locked into vendors uh, with limited choice, uh, with a high cost base. So choice, freedom to choose in terms of what database technologies they apply to which workloads, and certainly EDB and the work that has been done to closely marry what enterprise <coughs> RDVMS platforms offer with EDB's um, you know, work that they've done in terms of filling those gaps and addressing where the resiliency, monitoring, performance, and security requirements are, are certainly uh, required from an enterprise customer perspective. Choice is driving um, the move that we see and choice towards a lower cost platform that can be deployed anywhere, both on-prem uh, modernization, customers looking to retain on-premise platforms or moving into any multi-clouds, whether it's an infrastructure cloud play or a platform cloud play, and certainly with EDB's offering in terms of you know the, the latest cloud native offerings are also very interesting. And lastly, aside from just cost and the freedom to choose where they deploy those platforms, the SLA, the service level model, yeah, where is the resiliency requirement? Where are the, which system is going to bronze, silver, gold? Which ones are the tier one revenue platform, revenue generating platforms? Which ones are the lower, lower utility platforms? So a combination of choice, a combination of freedom to, to deploy anywhere and while still maintaining the res resiliency and the service levels that the customers uh, need to deliver to their businesses. Abdul, that was a beautiful setup and, and we got so much to talk about here because customers mm -hmm. want to move from point A to point B, <clears throat> but, but getting there, they, they need help. It's sometimes not trivial. So Charlie, Dow One is a consultancy. You've got a strong you know, technical capabilities. What are you seeing in this space? You, you know, what are the major trends? Why are organizations considering that move and what are some of the considerations there? Well, uh, like in other country in South Korea also, uh, our uh, a lot of customers, uh, banking, uh, manufacturing, and uh, distributor, they are 90, over 90%, 90 they are all uh, using Oracle DB and uh, Rack system. But as the uh, uh, previous presenter pointed out, a lot of customers got sick of the Oracle and uh, they have to undergo the huge cost of uh, maintenance cost. They want to move away from these uh, cost the stress. And secondly, uh, they can think about their providing service to customer on their cloud base, which is a private or the public. So we cannot imagine running on database, Oracle database running on the cloud system that's not matches on this uh, cloud. And, and sec uh, first and second, and uh, uh, Finally, the customer, what they want is the cost and they want to move away from the Oracle locking. 
they cannot be the, just a slave at Oracle for a long time and to prepare them for the new cloud service for the customer. Great, thank you for that. Yes, oh, go ahead. Did you have something else to add, Charlie? Go ahead, please. No, that, no, that's all. Sir. Okay, great. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Alan, w welcome to the Cube. You know, it's very interesting to us, IBM. You, you, of course, you're a big player in database. You have a lot of expertise here and you partner with EDB. You're offering Postgres to customers. You know, what are you seeing? Charlie was talking about you know, Oracle and Rack. I mean, the, the, the thing there is obviously, you know, we talked about the, the maintenance costs, but there's also a lot of high availability capabilities. That's something that IBM really understands well. Do you see this as largely a cloud migration trend? Uh, is it more modernization? Interested in what's IBM's perspective on this? Yeah, I think modernization is the right word. Um, the points that the, the previous panelists brought up are, are, are on point, right? You know, lower TCO, lower, lower costs in general. Um, but that kind of like agility and then availability for, for developers and, and data scientists as well. Um, and then of course, you know, hybrid cloud, right? You know, you want to be able to deploy on-prem or in the cloud or both and then a mixture of all of that. And, and I think, um, I think, you know, what, what ties it together is that customers are looking for insights, right? And, you know, especially in large organizations, there's a myriad of data sources that they're already working with. And yeah, we, you know, we want to be able to play in that space. We want to give an offering that is based on Postgres and open source and be able to what they're, do what they're strong at. Um, and kind of, you know, on top of that, you know, a layer of, of, of need that we see is, is seamless data governance across all of those different stores. All right, I, I'm going to go right to the heart of the hard problem here. So if I, I mean, I want to, as I said, I want to get from point A to point B. I want to save money. I want to modernize. But if I'm the, the canary in the coal mine at the customer, I'm saying, guys, migration uh, scares me. Uh, how do I do that? What are the considerations and, and what do I need to know that I don't know? So Abdul, maybe you could walk us through what are some of the concerns that customers have? How do you help mitigate those? Uh, whether it's other application dependencies, you know, freezing code, uh, uh, you know, getting again from that point A to point B without risking my existing business processes. How do you handle that? Yeah, certainly. I think um, customer needs to understand what the journey looks like to begin with. So we've actually developed our own methodology that we call Rapid Cloud, which is also part of our cloud modernization strategy that builds in a database modernization strategy built into it. Starts with an assessment in terms of current state discovery. Not all customers totally understand where they are today. So understanding where the database state is, you know, where the risks lie, what are the criticalities of the various databases? What technologies are in use? Where we have rack, where we don't have rack, where we have data guard, where we have encryption and so on. That gives the customer a very good insight in terms of the current state, both commercially and technically. And that's a key point, you know, to understand how they're licensed today and what costs could be freed up to free the journey, to effectively fund the journey is a, is a big, big topic. Uh, but once we do that, we get an idea and we've actually developed a tool that we call Rapid Discovery that's able to uh, discover a larger state without knowing the database list. We just point the scripts at the database servers themselves. And it tells us exactly which databases are suited uh, to be you know, effectively migrated to Postgres uh, with, in terms of the feature function usage, in terms of how heavy they are with store procedures in the database, the amount of business logic, use of technologies like Rack and Data Guard and how they convert over to, uh, to Postgres specifically. That ultimately gives us the ability to give the customer an assessment and that assessment in a short, sharp few weeks can give the customer a view of all of my you know, uh, hundreds of databases. Here are the subset of candidates for Postgres. And specifically then we do the uh, schema advisor tool, the actual assessment tool from EDB, which gives us a sense of how well the schema gets converted and how, be how best to then also look at the stored procedure conversion as well. That gives the customer a full view of their architecture mapping, their specific candidate databases, and then a cost analysis in terms of what that migration looks like and how we migrate and how do we also run and maintain those platforms once we're on EDB. Thank you for that. Again, very clear. But so you're not replacing, doing an organ transplant. You may, you're, you're, I, you know, I don't mean this as a pejorative, but you're kind of cherry picking those workloads that are appropriate for EDB uh, and then moving those and then maybe, maybe through attrition or you know, over time sunsetting uh, those other th those other core pieces. Uh, exactly, exactly. Charlie, exactly. let me ask you. So, so we talked about rack, real application clusters, data guard. These are you know you know kind of high profile Oracle capabilities. 
Uh, can, you, can you really replicate the kind of resiliency at, at lower cost with open source, with EDB Postgres? And how do you do that? It's my turn, sir. Yes, please. Um, uh, quite technically, uh, I cannot go on very much in depth and technically. Uh, the REC, uh, RDC system is so called is the best, you know, best tool to protect the data, and uh, especially in the Unix system. Uh, but uh, apart from the REC, uh, it provides some nice uh, data replication solution, which is stream replication and log shipping and something up and they monitor PAM and, and EFM solution, which is enterprise failable manager. So even though if, if we compare Apple to Apple rare uh, versus with uh, EDB solution, we can uh, definitely say that RAG is more stable one, but after migration, whatever, we can overcome the you know drawbacks of the HA cluster system by providing the EDB tools. So uh, whatever uh, uh, the customer feel that after successful migration, utilizing the uh, uh, EDB uh, high, high availability failable solution, they can make themselves feel at home. So that's, that's how we approach it with the customers. So Alan, again, to me, IBM is fascinating here with your level of involvement because you're the, you guys are sort of historically the master of proprietary mainframes, vSAM, CICS, DB2, all that stuff. And then, you know, IBM was the first, I remember Steve Mills actually announced, we we're going to invest a billion dollars in open source with Linux. And, and that was a major industry milestone. And of course the, 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 the acquisition of Red Hat. So you've got now this open source mindset, this open source culture. So. We, you know, as uh, it's all about recovery in, in database and, and enterprise database and all of acid properties and two phase commits. And we're talking about, you know, the things that Charlie just talked about. So what's your perspective here? IBM knows a lot about this. How do you help customers get there? Yeah, well, I mean, the main, the main thrust right now, IBM has a, uh, offering called IBM Cloud Pack for Data, which you may, may pro of course. Probably Absolutely. And and which, which runs EDB, right? EDB Postgres runs on top of Cloud Pack for Data. Um, but the you know I think going back to Abdul's uh, points about you know migrating whatever is needed and, and whatever can be migrated to Postgres and maybe you know migrating other things to other places. Um, we have data virtualization and auto SQL, right? So once you have migrated those parts of of your database or those schemas that can be. Um, having you know a single point where you can query across them, and, and by the way, being able to query across them, uh, you know, before, during, and after migration as well, right? So we kind of have that seamless experience of, of SQL, layer of SQL, uh, and now with Auto SQL uh, uh, of, of Spark SQL as well, um, as you're as you're migrating and after, um, is it, I'd say you know key to this. What's the typical migration look like? I, I know, I'm sorry, but it, you know, I know it's a consultant question, but just thinking about the, you know, the average, uh, in terms of time frame, what do the teams look like? You know, who are the stakeholders that I need to get involved if I'm a customer to really make this a success? Uh, maybe, maybe Abdul, you could talk about that and, and Charlie and Alan could chime in. Sure, I think, well, number one, you need a, an exec sponsor who's bought into it in terms of the business case, supporting the business case. An architect who's got a big picture, understanding not only database technology, but also infrastructure that they're coming from, as well as the target cloud platforms and how you ensure that the infrastructure can deliver the performance. So the architect world is important. Of course, the core DBA that lives within the, the scope of the database, understands the schema, the data model, the business logic itself, and the application owner. And that's key specifically around the application certification, testing, <clears throat> connectivity, and uh, the migration of the code. And specifically in terms of timeline, just to touch on that, you know, quickly, I mean, in our experience so far, and we're seeing the momentum really, really take off in the last 18 months, uh, a small project with limited business logic within the database itself can be migrated, you know, in a couple of months, but typically with all the testing and rigor around that, we typically say a three month timeline, a medium sized complexity project, a six month timeline, and a large complex project could be anything from nine months uh, and beyond. But it really comes down to how heavy the database is with business logic in the database and how much effort it will take to re-engineer, effectively migrate that PLC for business logic into EDB. Given the compatibility level between Oracle and EDB, it's relatively, it's certainly a, an easier path than any other 
target platform uh, in terms of options. Um, yeah, from our perspective, that certainly looks like the composition of a team and timeline. Uh, Charlie or Alan, anything you guys would add? Yeah, yeah. So, so I think all those personas uh, make sense. I think uh, you might, on the consumer side of the consuming of the consuming of the data side, the data scientists uh, often we see, you know, in, during migrations, and then um, obviously the DevOps. I think or any operations, right, have to be heavily involved. Uh, and then lastly, you know, you see more and more data steward role or data steward type persona, CDO office type type person coming in uh, to make sure that you know whatever. Uh, data governance that is already in place or wants to be in place after the migration is, is also part of the conversation. Good points. Why, why EDB? You know, there's a lot of databases out there. You know, it's funny. I always say like, you know, 10 and 15 years ago, databases were kind of, it, it was kind of a boring market, right? It was like, okay, you got know, Oracle, okay, whatever. They, and now it's exploded. You got open source databases, you got, you know, not only SQL databases, you got graph databases, you know, you got cloud databases, it's, it's going crazy. Why EDB? I wonder if you guys could address that. Alan, why don't you go first this time? I'll, I'll compliment your answer. Yeah, I mean, I, again, it goes back to, to the, the, I guess, varying needs in, in enterprises, right? And, and I think that's what's driven this explosion in databases, whether it's a document store, like you're saying, or, or new types of RDBMS. Um, the, need, the needs that we talked about at the beginning, like lower, lower TCO to, and then push to open source. But you know, the fact of the matter is that, that yes, there is a myriad, an ecosystem of databases in pretty much any organization. And so, yeah, we, we want to tap into that. Um, and, and why EDB, you know, EDB has done a, a great job of taking Postgres and making it enterprise ready. Um, you know, that, that, that's what they're, they're good at. And, and that, you know, fits very nicely with, with the IBM story, obviously. Um, and, and so, you know, and, you know, and then they've, they've worked with us as well. They, they have an operator on, on that runs on Red Hat OpenShift. So that makes it portable as well. And also part of the IBM cloud Pack for data story. Um, and, and yeah, you know, we want to break down those silos. We realize that that need is there uh, for all of these, you know, there's this ecosystem of databases. And so, uh, you know, we're, you know, we see our role as being that platform, you know, wh whether it's Red Hat OpenShift or IBM Cloud Pack for Data that, that unifies and, and kind of gives you that, that single pane of glass across all of those uh, sources. And Charlie, you're obviously all in. You got EDB in your in your in your background. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why yeah. EDB um, for you? You you know. Yeah, before well. talking IEDB, uh, you asked about the previous question about how the migration was difficult from Oracle to EDB. Uh, we had a couple of success stories in Korea, telecom and some uh, banking uh, area, and it was not easy. So. Uh, EDB provide the MTK tool, as people know, but it was not perfect, like 90%. So we are the channel partner of the EDB for four years. So what we have done was to hire the Oracle expert. So we train Oracle expert as as EDB expert at the same time, so that they can approach customer and make it easy. So you have no worry about that. Just the migrating EDB uh, Oracle to EDB. There's no issue, no stress test. It includes all the tests, uh, you know, stress test, test and training and a POC with that. So by investing that Oracle expert that we could overcome and persuade the customer to uh, adopt EDB. So why EDB? Simply, I can say that, is there any database they can finally replace Oracle in the world? Why is there is the interoperability between Oracle to uh, EDB, as he, many uh, experts pointed out. There is no other DB they can, you know, 90% uh, 90 in, in compatibility and interoperability with EDB. That's why, of course, there's some, uh, you know, budget issues, some maintenance issue, cost issue, uh, escape from Oracle lock-in. But I think the, uh, the Number one reason was the interoperability and the compatibility with uh, uh, Oracle database. That was the reason, I guess. Great, Abdul. I, I, we've talked about. We all know the as is. You got high maintenance cost. You, you got a lot of tuning, and it's just a lot of complexity. What about the two B? Maybe you could share with us sort of the outcomes, some of the outcomes you've seen. What 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 the business impact has been of some of these migrations? 
Sure. I mean, I'll give you a very simple example in just the idea of running Oracle um, on-prem. A lot of customer systems teams, for example, will drive a virtualization VMware strategy. We know some of the challenges of running Oracle on VMware from a license perspective. So giving the business the ability to have one particular customer in the financial services market in New York, um, heavy virtualization strategy, the ability for them to move away from Oracle on you know, uh, expensive hardware onto Postgres EDB on virtualization, just leverage existing skill sets, uh, leverage existing investment in terms of infrastructure, and also give them portability into AWS, the other clouds, you know, in terms of a migration. Um, more from a business perspective as well, I would say, come back to some of the Alan's points in terms of just freeing up the ability for data scientists and data consumers to, you know, to, to, to consume some of that data from a Postgres perspective, more accessibility, spinning up environments quicker, less latency in terms of, so agility is another keyword in terms of the tangible differences, the business, lower cost, agility, and the freedom to deploy anywhere at the end of the day. Choice is, I think, the key word that we keep coming back to and knowing that we can do that to Charlie's point specifically around maintaining service levels. And as architects, <clears throat> we support some of the big, big names out there in terms of airlines, uh, online cosmetic, uh, retailers, uh, financial services, trading applications, hedge funds. And they all want one thing as architect for us to deliver that resiliency and stand behind them. And as the MSP, we're accountable to ensure those systems are up and running and performing. So knowing that EDB's you know, provided the compatibility, but also plugged the specific requirements around performance management, security, availability, that's you know, fundamentally been key. Yeah, so I mean, having done a lot of TCO studies in this area, it's, it's, it, Oracle's different. You know, normally the biggest component of TCO is labor. With Oracle, the biggest component of TCO is license and maintenance costs. So if you can virtualize and reduce those costs, and of course, of course, Oracle will fight you and say we won't support it in the VMware environment. Of course, you know you, they will. But but but, but you got to really exactly. you got to battle. But so here's my last question. So if I'm a customer in that state that you described, you know, a lot of you know sort of Oracle sprawl, a lot of databases out there, high maintenance costs, the whole lock-in thing. I got choices, I, you know, a lot of choices out there. One is EDB, you guys have convinced me that you've got the expertise. It's, it, it, you know, if I, get, if I can partner with, with, with firms like yours, uh, it's safer route, okay, cool. My other choice is Oracle's gonna, the Oracle sales rep's gonna get me in a headlock and talk about Exadata and how they're Oracle Cloud and how it's, it's, it, it, they've invested a lot there and they have, um, and, and I can pay by the drink. All this you know, sort of modern sort of discussion, you know, you know Oracle act like they invented <laughs> late to the game and then here we are. So, so could, help me, what's the pitch as to, well, that's kind of compelling. It's maybe the safe bet they're, they're, they're working with my CIO, whatever. Why should I go with the open source route versus that route? It sounds kind of attractive to me. Help me understand that. Each of you, maybe take me through that. Abdul, why don't you start? Yeah, I'd say, you know, Oracle's been the de facto for so many years that people have just assumed and defaulted saying, high availability, RAP, DR, data guard, you know, and I'll apply it to any database need I have. And at the end of the day, customers have a three tier database requirement. The lowest, you know, less critical bronze level databases that really don't need rack or uh, high availability. The silver tier that are deep environmental solutions that need some level of resiliency. And then you've got your gold revenue producing, you know, brand impacting databases that are, if they're down. And certainly day one, we see no reason why the bronze and silver databases can't be targeted towards EDB. Admittedly, we have some of our largest customers are running, you know, uh, platforms are running $5 million an hour e-commerce platform or airlines running large e-commerce platforms. Now, Exadata certainly has a place. Rack has a place in those, in those scenarios. Um, we're not saying that you know, EDB is a solution for everything in all scenarios, but apply the technology where it's appropriate, where it's required. And, you know, generally wherever Oracle has been the de facto and it's been applied across the estate, that's fundamentally what's changed. It doesn't have to be the only answer. You have multiple choices. Now EDB provides us with the ability to probably address, you know, more than 50% of the database estate and comfortably cope with that and just apply that more expensive kind of gold tier one cost base, but also capability, you know, from the highest uh, requirements of performance and availability where it's appropriate. Yeah, very pragmatic approach, Abdul. Thank you for that. Charlie, Charlie, what's your perspective? Give, give us your closing thoughts. Well, uh, it has been, uh, Oracle has been dominating in Asia, in like South Korea has market over, over uh, many years. 
So customers got, got tired of this and continue spending money for the maintenance costs and there is no uh, discount. <laughs> there is no negotiation. So they want to move away from expensive uh, stuff and they were looking for a uh, flexible platform with uh, easy going and high speed and performance open source database like a uh, possibly SQL. And now the EDB cannot replace 100% of existing legacy Oracle, but 10%, 20%, 50% as time goes on, the trend will continue and it will be reaching uh, some high point of replacing the existing Oracle system. And it, could, it can also lead into a good business chance to a channel partner and ADB steps and other related business in open source. Great, thank you, Charlie. And Alan, bring us home here. Give us your yeah, I think I think my my, my co co panelists have hit the nail on the head. Right, it's a menu. Right, that that's as things become more diverse and as people make more choices and as everybody wants more agility, you have to you have to provide a menu. And and so that that's where that's coming in. And I, I like the way that Abdul kind of split it into gold, silver, and then bronze. Um, yeah, and and uh, I, I think that. That that's where where we're going, right? I mean, they, they, you should ask your developers, right? <laughs> are are your developers like just pining to start up a new instance of Oracle every time they're starting a new project? Probably not. They reach for their Postgres, right? And so because of that, that that's where this is coming from, and and that's not going to change. And and uh, yeah, that you know that ecosystem is going to continue to to thrive, and there will be you know lots of different flavors uh, in the you know growing open source ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, open source absolutely is the underpinning, you know, the, the, the bedrock of innovation these days. Gentlemen, great power panel. Thanks so much for bringing your perspectives and, and, and best of luck in the future. Thank you, Dave. We'll try Thank and uh, match your uh, background to the uh, ah, yes. <laughs> right. Next time we'll, we'll up our game. <laughs> okay, and thank you for watching everybody. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE. Stay tuned for more great coverage of Postgres Vision 21. Be right back. <laughs>